Now, my personal encounter was with the railroad station. Uh, they built a tall wooden fence there, and the, the, nobody was permitted to approach the fence. The word was out that they had machine guns lined up alongside the fence and the street, which paralleled the railroad tracks. But even then, you see, uh, I was not so much afraid of uh, the machine guns as, you know, my discipline, you know, I did not have permission to sneak up on the railroad station. I had permission to go and get something from the city, buy something. But I sneaked up uh, to the fence, and I was in my cassock. So I, I really stood out there because I looked left and right, but I didn't see, any, see anybody, even soldiers. So, and I found a hole there. It was a raw wood fence. And that was the day when I saw my train, my dep deportee train. And it just must have pulled into the station. That I see uh, very with great clarity, no difficulty to of recall at all, colors, everything. It was a cattle train, and right in front of me, just about two tracks from the uh, fence, uh, stood one of the wagons. I could see some more because the hole was large, and it was just opened. It was opened by an SS soldier. That I noticed, those were already German soldiers. I didn't see Hungarians there. And it was, uh, the impression was terrible because it was terribly packed. I literally saw what uh, you see in pictures, uh, mothers with children and people and old people and little children and all. The impression was terrifying. It was really uh, packed, uh, I mean uh, compressed. And one man immediately jumped off. And I always uh, remembered his face because he looked a little bit like my father. And he must have been uh, something like mid-40s, closing on 50. I did not hear what he said to the German soldier, to that SS soldier. But his behavior was polite. He jumped off. And my feeling was, my instinct, or what I made out, that he was asking for water. And immediately, that as a soldier, uh, with the club of his rifle, uh, clapped him down, uh, and several times, I to insensitivity, uh, uh, whether he died or uh, whether he was later put on the track, and then I ran away. I was so scared and I was so upset. I never saw anything like this in my life. I simply ran away. And you know this. I see it personally as the greatest tragedy of my life. That, you know, there uh, Jewish people were deported around me. I didn't do anything. I panicked. I, not even panic, not even fear. I just didn't know what to do. Now, my second direct experience was uh, the crying in the night. It was summertime, uh, and uh, uh, it was one of those very, uh, very quiet nights. Uh, and uh, I could not sleep for some reason, and there was enough moisture in the air. We were quite far from the railroad station, but somehow there must have been enough moisture to carry sound. And I woke up to a sound of many people, my impression was literally thousands of people crying. I didn't know what it was first. Uh, it, was, it was a terrifying impression. Uh, and then I realized the, this is the sound of people crying. Uh, I, I remember even reflecting, you know, that uh, must be children, uh, women, men, everybody, because it, it was that kind of a chorus uh, wailing and crying. And next morning, I uh, talked to the several other people who were still left in the, in the, the 
uh, our, uh, our Jesuit house and ask them if they heard something, uh, our housekeeper, our custodian. And they all said that they heard it. And I think it was the custodian, a gardener, a janitor, who told me that uh, those were the Jewish people crying because at our station, uh, the Hungarian gendarmerie handed them over to the SS troops to be deported to Germany. And sometimes uh, when this happened, uh, the people would start to cry, and that would spread to the whole train. And this is what we heard that night. I didn't know about the dead camps as such at that time. And I didn't know about the ovens, the burning. Uh, uh, but I personally, at that moment, I felt a persuasion coming up on me that these people will be all killed. And again, you see, this is uh, where I uh, stress what I am trying to say. Uh, I wish I could uh, live my life. Today, maybe, I would be ready to then run in front of the train and lay down. And I don't want to sound dramatic. Uh, maybe I, I would have, uh, today I would uh, call out or uh, protest or risk uh, being shut down or clubbed down. And at that time, I was immobilized. It was just, you know, a feeling, uh, not o even a feeling of what can I do? There is nothing to do. Uh, just running away, simply running away. It, it, was, it was beyond my experience. I was utterly unprepared. I remember waking up on a Saturday morning. I heard shots. Again, I quickly ran to my window. That was my, my observation point. Like my, my eyes must have been three times as big as, as they are now because I remember spending lots of hours in that window. Uh, I ran to it and we, I looked around and I saw dead people. Uh, all around in, uh, on the square. About an hour later, um, I heard German voices, Rouse, Rouse, Rouse. That was one word that I learned very quickly. I meant out, out, out. It was like a dog, like dogs barking. And uh, they were German voices telling everybody, all Jews out, all Jews out at the square. Uh, we heard people beginning to cry and uh, chaos. Uh, everybody was running up and down in my building. My, my cousin finally uh, started yelling to, to my family and whoever, because people started running into the hiding place and out. Nobody knew what, quite what to do. Some of us who got into the hiding place, yeah, my cousin finally shut the door and said, all right, now you're in and nobody out. I myself started crying and I, I said I wanted to go with everybody else. My dad also wanted to go, but he closed the door. He closed the, 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 the little door underneath and he said, nobody's moving out of here. As a matter of fact, he, I remember him saying distinctly, he said, if you're going to die, you're going to die right here. You're not going to walk to your death. I started crying. And, uh, but then I, he made me shut up. And uh, he, then I looked out through, there was a, the only opening for, uh, for air was, there was like a porthole here under the roof. And I looked out and I saw lots of Jews with little packages walking towards the square. And uh, I also saw my grandfather, my other grandfather my, from my father's side, who lived in a different building, and, his, and my grandma coming over, and they were looking up and uh, uh, deciding whether to come, to come up and hide with us or to go away. And finally I saw them walk, again, walk away, and I never saw them again. 
I heard, I heard people yelling and screaming and crying and shooting and a whole town crying. So, but when we went to Majdanek, this was just the most terrible. As much as I experienced bad things after, but this was, they put us in cattle cars and they pushed in I don't know how many people but they really wanted us to die and uh, we were in this, those wagons um, uh, I don't know how many people were there but my brother died in my arms my younger brother who was My husband's two sisters. There was not enough oxygen for all those people. And they kept us in those wagons for days. They wanted us to die in the wagons. You know, the kettle cars with very little windows. How old was your brother? Maybe 13. He wasn't even by my spouse. So, you know, when my brother died in my arms, I said to myself, I'm going to live. I must be the only one survivor for my family. I'm going to live. I made up my mind that I'm going to defy Hitler. I'm not going to give in because he wants me to die. I'm going to live. I'm going to just be very, very strong. And this is something really nightmarish. When we came to that camp. I can probably describe something for somebody who hasn't seen it, but has seen the film The Apocalypse Now. We came at night and we were surrounded by a group of people with yellow faces. begging for scraps of bread covered with blankets a typical Muslim as it, we found out the following day work C was fabricating the chemicals, namely picrine, to fill the shells. This is the explosive thing that explodes in the artillery shells. And working with that chemical, your lifespan is only three, four months. Your skin turns yellow, you shrivel, and these were the picrinaires that surrounded us. Auschwitz, if I would like to describe it, I would say that is, that has not been, that has not been, people did not invent an expression what Auschwitz was. It was hell on earth. And The silence of Auschwitz was hell. The nights were hell. 
and the days somehow we, we got up at three o'clock in the morning and at four o'clock summertime or four thirty when the sun came up it was not like the sun i swear to you it was not bright it was always red to me it was always black to me it never said nev ne never was life to me it was destruction the sun was never beautiful and when the um, moon was out it meant only destruction we almost forgot what life was all about <laughs>